Hello and welcome everyone. A very good morning to everyone on the American shores of the Atlantic and a warm good afternoon to those on the Eastern shores. My name is Male Obadhya and I'm the Chief Customer Experience Officer at Sales Choice. I welcome you to this fascinating session we have lined up for you on the imperative to build a world-class AI and data sciences organization. And I would like to be begin by thanking the Bedford Consulting Group and its co-founders, Stephen and Howard Bedzim, as well as Zachary Wan for all the support they have given us in putting this together. We have uh, an incredible lineup to go through our discussions, starting with Dr. Danny Lange, Senior Vice President of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning at Unity. As the head of machine learning at Unity, he leads the company's innovation around AI and machine learning, focusing on bringing AI to simulation and gaming. Prior to this, he was the head of machine learning at Uber, and he also served as the general manager of Amazon Machine Learning. Before that, he was the principal development manager at Microsoft, where he led a product team focused on large scale ML for big data. He has spent eight years on speech recognition systems, first as the CTO of General Magic, and then through his work on General Motors on Star Virtual Advisor, which incidentally was one of the largest deployments of intelligent personal assistant until Siri, which we all know, of course. Danny started his career as a computer scientist at IBM and holds an MS and PhD degrees in computer science from the Technical University of Denmark. And he's a member of ACM and IEEE Computer Society and no surprises has several patents to his credit. Welcome, Danny. We also have joining us Jenny Lam, Chief Business Officer at Wattpad. She's a senior executive with over 15 years of experience working in technology and high growth consumer startups. Wattpad, as you know, is the world's leading social storytelling platform that is home to a community of more than 90 million people. Prior to Wattpad, Jenny led growth and user acquisition at Shapeways, the world's largest 3D printing service. She has also worked at Yahoo as director of platform strategy and mobile payments company GoPayGo as head of marketing and business intelligence. And before her startup career, she spent three years as a management consultant at Accenture. He, she holds an MBA from the Harvard Business School and a BS in economics from Cornell University. She is passionate about helping young professionals find fulfillment in their careers, which is always fascinating to hear. We also have Kathy Kobe, EY Global Trusted AI Leader. She oversees a global team that works on the ethical risk and control implications of AI and autonomous systems. With 25 years of experience as a technology risk advisor and a chartered professional accountant, Kathy has assisted global organizations in conducting enterprise risk assessments that are used to ask better questions and address multidimensional technology issues. That's something we look forward to doing a lot of in this session, and we welcome Kathy and Jenny with open arms. Last but not the least, Joining me as a co-host is Dr. Cindy Gordon, CEO and founder of SalesChoice, an AI SaaS company focused on ending revenue uncertainty using AI methods. She has held former senior executive roles at Accenture, Citicorp, and Xerox, and has also been a venture capitalist, an active mentor, coach, and the MindBridge AI Impact AI Leader of the Year 2019, Dr. Gordon is the author of 14 books. She is also a Forbes AI Media contributor and an AI board advisor to the Forbes School of Business and Technology. So welcome everyone. If we can move to slide number three, without further ado to kick off with the agenda, we will dive straight into the questions that matter for the session, which deal with the level of trust of AI, the biggest challenges that C-suites uh, may face, the ethical concerns, as well as the global opportunities and risks that they need to be aware of. So with an audience comprising of a lot of executive leaders globally, I dare say, this promises to be a fascinating session and I welcome one and all once again. With that, let me turn things over to Cindy to start off the session. Cindy? Thanks, Malay, and uh, we'll go to the next slide, Zachary. 
Uh, welcome everybody and uh, really delighted to have an opportunity to share the uh, the session with Danny and uh, Kathy and Jenny. Um, you know, there's been so much focus these days on AI, you can't pick up any magazine or uh, any newspaper or without some kind of a perspective. Uh, today we really wanted to zoom in on some of the key aspects of trust, uh, what people are seeing in terms of emergence there. And I thought Kathy could kick us off in terms of some of the recent research that Ernst & Young has done on where is trust within the C-suite or at the board directories, just to get a you know, very strategic perspective right off the bat. So Kathy, I'm gonna turn things over to you to, uh, to kick us off. Thanks, Cindy. Um, you know, I think with all technologies, um, you know, trusting in the technology, making sure you've got good, good you know, understanding of it, um, where it works and where it doesn't has always been important. But I think AI is, is kind of unique in that um, very early on in its use in enterprises, um, ethical considerations have been at the forefront of the conversation. And that's continued, you know, over the last decade as its use cases and its plethora of um, use across different organizations has, has really accelerated. But what we've been finding in a lot of the surveys and research is that trust and, and actually mistrust uh, in the technology is actually slowing down some of its uh, use in organizations. And I think that's coming from several different um, avenues. I think, first of all, it's, it's a very broad technology. Like artificial intelligence is actually really difficult to, to narrow down into what it means because it actually covers quite a lot of use cases and technologies. And um, because of that, um, there isn't just one set of risks that need to be managed because it does change um, based on the different use cases. And certainly we've all been privy to some of the, the media um, you know, sensationalizing some of the, the real big um, hits and misses of AI. And, and, you know, now we're starting to see some of those failures actually hitting the courts and, and regula regulatory fines being, being subjected. And so, you know, it is creating some unease within uh, C-suite executives because they recognize that it's a technology that has a lot of opportunity. Um, it can, you know, really help accelerate um, the, the insights and the, the speed of which, um, you know, more personalized services can be brought to customers. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of C-suite executives are kind of challenged with whether they feel they've actually got the right governance and control frameworks within their organizations to really be able to, um, you know, um, be good stewards to their customers with the information um, that they can actually you know, predict where it might um, fail and make sure that they've got those safeguards in place. And so, you know, I think it's it's a technology that really C-suites have no choice but to continue to push and, and, and invest into, but, you know, need to also do that with some um, some thought in regards to um, doing, making sure that it's done in, in, a, in a controlled fashion. And um, it, it's one of those technologies that, you um, you know, is in some cases um, more decentralized across the organizations. It's not coming in through the large IT technology projects, but instead, you know, through more of their businesses, you know, finding opportunities to use this technology. And so um, it is one of those technologies that um, are, are finding them way, their, its way through a, a lot of different um, spots within organizations. And but, you know, what we're finding is that, you know, C-suite executives are educating themselves very quickly. Um, they are investing into chief ethical officers, uh, chief AI officers, you know, recognizing that they need to have those disciplines and perspectives into their organization. We're seeing a lot of push towards creating, you know, trustworthy principles, um, you know, really looking to find ways in order to create those trusts. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still very um, bullish about the technology and uh, just, you know, trying to work with our different clients to make sure that uh, they're feeling comfortable that they can move forward um, with it in a trustworthy manner. Thanks, Kathy, for, you know, laying the foundation um, and perspectives. And, you know, we've also seen the tremendous investment people are making on education and uh, leveling up. And also now the board of directors are starting to have some fundamental modules on uh, AI and uh, duty of care. So Danny, uh, I want to turn things to you because you've been right in the operational throes over you know, many years, right? And so if you could really just kind of drill down on lessons learned, stories, um, in particular of how you've moved along um, the executives in alignment to support your investments, uh, maybe to sustain and be patient uh, 
with uh, the ongoing, um, I'd call it evolution that happens with AI models. So uh, over to you, Danny, to take yeah. us down um, to some practical uh, stories. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, that uh, trust in trust in AI is, is, is in, in some sense, it's evolving. I, I, very early on, there was a um, there was a, a great deal of curiosity and a great deal of trust that we would see some amazing results from AI, which we have. But I think that the last maybe 12, 18 months have also shown us that uh, AI is really a, a, a different beast. Uh, AI is more than data science in the traditional sense. Yeah, it's it's uh, the nature of AI is that uh, you in in a sense the genie out of the bottle. In in if you compare it to, to traditional data science, you you'll do your you'll do your analysis, you'll make recommendations, and and management will uh, execute uh, following that recomm those recommendations. But with AI, you create a feedback loop. You have a like a flywheel, and that created a lot of interest and a lot of urgency in deploying AI early on. But what I think we have seen over the last 12 to 18 months is that some of, some of those feedback loops have been coming back, uh, biting us. Uh, because what they do is that they create dynamic systems that, that may very well um, amplify unwanted behavior. Uh, so it can be that uh, because you have a lot of male applicants for software engineering positions, then AI will very quickly learn from that and amplify that so that uh, fewer and fewer uh, uh, participants of, on, on the female audience will see those job ads and, and, and at the end of the day, it will sort of amplify that there's a certain uh, group of a population that clicks on those job ads and, 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 and it will sort of really optimize it in a very unfortunate way. And I think that's what we have seen uh, recently is that a lot of these algorithms have, when we take a second look at them, uh, cost uh, bias, created trouble for, for the companies that, that, that host these algorithms. And uh, it, which in itself is of course uh, a, a negative thing, but the reaction has been very fast. We have been, uh, starting to have a lot of conversation around uh, ethical AI, responsible AI. Uh, there's a great, great interest in, in looking close at the data that we use for training machine learning systems now. Uh, so, so overall, um, you know, there has been experiences where we have, uh, have had unwanted uh, results. But I think that the, the positive of this is that we're getting much, much more, con more conscious about the impact of data, the impact of these algorithms, and uh, I, I personally believe that we will we will see a a, a much better um, understanding of the impact of AI going forward, and uh, I think we will uh, across the board with a, with a great focus on the ethical side of this, uh, make sure that these algorithms do more good uh, than bad. Thanks, Danny, um, for those uh, comments. Um, I'm going to throw one uh, short question to you, um, if you could add a little bit more commentary. How did you go about engaging the executives as you sort of went through your, your journey, right? Because obviously the cost infrastructures for building the AI data sciences uh, talent is not an inexpensive uh, proposition. So how did you go about, uh, you know, engaging the C-suite and your peers and bring them along in your, in your journey uh, as you, you know, tried to build these models and also drive out the value realization outcomes? Yeah, there's a great deal of, of education in this. There's a uh, great deal of, 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 uh, of, providing uh, information, providing results. Um, one of the approaches I have pursued is to, to really uh, get into uh, every corner of the corporation, not, not pick a, a single hero project and put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, it's really working across many teams in the organization. You build up uh, a a support team of other executives, other uh, managers across uh, across many teams, and and you provide broad impact. We we did that at Microsoft. We did that at at uh, Amazon. Uh, 
at Uber, we created a machine learning platform for the entire company used by many, many teams. And in that sense, you, you, you build up an, an, an army of supporters that uh, impact uh, the C-suite that basically help you get the story to the very top of the company of the value that these uh, systems uh, uh, bring to the corporation and bring to the business. And in that sense, you actually create a positive feedback loop because we all know that these uh, systems are very, very impactful, that they do uh, increase the efficiency of the organization. And, and that is seen at the very, very top of, uh, top of the companies. Thanks, Danny, for that additional context. Uh, Zach, we'll move to the next slide. And I'm gonna bring in uh, Jenny's voice now. Uh, we've kind of painted the, the picture in the sense of where there's the confidence levels, um, you know, Kathy sort of painted in the sense some of the challenges there. Uh, Danny brought in, you know, perspectives of sort of the last 18 months and, you know, some little bit of caution emerging. Um, also some of the practical aspects of engagement. So Jenny, this question is really around, there's so many aspects of deploying a successful AI uh, in data sciences uh, function within uh, the organization. Uh, maybe you could pick it up and then, you know, talk more from uh, your company's perspective and what you've learned and sort of that grassroots um, engagement that I know you have a lot of passion for. Sure, I'm very happy to, to give some perspective there and share a more operating uh, perspective or view. Um, and I actually really want to echo what Danny just said to start it off, which I recently read a quote by Satya, Satya Nadella, the Microsoft CEO, who said that AI is the runtime that is going to shape all of what we do. And so it really speaks to if you can position AI as critical path to many operations within the business, which is what we've been able to do over time, um, there's a lot more appetite and excitement and up, uptake for it. And so a little bit of context on Wattpad to help to sort of explain, you know, who we are, as I, I'm curious if people can uh, identify in the chat if you've heard of Wattpad or not, just a quick yes or no. Um, you know, our core demographic is Gen Z um, and people from around the world, uh, 90 million people around the world use Wattpad on a monthly basis to read, write, and connect on stories. So the fundamental thing of what we do is we provide a platform um, where anyone can write a story, uh, IP, and anyone in the world can find it and read it and engage on it. And so when you have 90 million people who are engaging on, we have over a billion individual uploads, we actually sit on top of a lot of data. And <clears throat> about five years ago, um, you know, we, we've really grown every year at a pretty fast clip over the past five or 10 years. But about five years ago, it got to the point where we had too much information. We had just too much data and we, needed to, be, to best utilize it in order to find the right story for the right person at the right time. See what's actually trending and what's doing well and be, be able to bring that to a studio or a publisher. Um, and here we are sitting on all this data, what do we do with it? And we were running big data analytics and algorithms that really helped sort through it, but we weren't getting to the crux of what we needed, which was to understand the content of each of these stories and uploads themselves. We were looking at user engagement data to see what to recommend to you next, but we actually didn't know if we were recommending a fantasy story or a sci-fi or a romance because we didn't know the data, the contents of the data itself. So as a startup at the time, venture funded, not yet profitable company, how could we spend time and energy investing in machine learning when there were all these other critical path priorities we needed to do? Um, and what we did was we literally carved out a part of our business and said, we're not, we're not going to touch this except to start our basic data labeling initiative, which will eventually lead to machine learning models. Um, and it was a very long-term view and a very intentional separated perspective. Otherwise it would have been very tempting to say, oh no, we have these <laughs> analysts here and these scientists there. We need them to help with what we're needing to do today. So there was that intentionality that was really critical path. And what it's enabled us to do is now we have tested and failed at many, many models, but we also have tested and succeeded as a, as a large handful that now are serving as the operational runtime of our business. And what does that actually mean? What does that actually look like? Every year WAPAD runs probably the largest uh, writing contest in the world. 
I looked into getting Guinness to certify it to see if we could say that. It's a very in-depth process to get Guinness certification. Um, but every year we get hundreds of thousands of story submissions to be a part of a Wadi's winner, which is an exclusive group of people whose stories have been um, selected as the best of the best amongst the many, many, many millions. So when you have hundreds of thousands of submissions, how do we start to comb through that at any level of speed um, so that we can actually run it every year instead of every decade? Uh, and we were able to apply one of our machine learning models, which is called the Quality Indexer. And we trained our models on Gutenberg classics, as well as nine years of Wadi's winners, um, to really be able to rank every story based on a quality score. Um, and what that did was it helped us filter down from 100,000 to a few thousand, which then humans had to read. Right At the end of the day, machine learning is a supplement and a complement that's critical path to the business. But for us, there's an understanding that's really a combination of art and science. And so humans were able to then read it. And we've been able to find stories that have you know, gone from obscurity to now being on bookshelves around the world. Um, historically inaccurate is a wonderful story of a, of a young immigrant experience. And we were able to find that through applying our machine learning models to comb through hundreds of thousands of stories in order to then identify the winners. Um, and so we've been able to apply it in a way that's really been able to help with many different aspects of our business. It now serves as a part of our algorithms for recommendations. Um, it helps comb through stories and identify hidden gems that we want to then bring to um, the big studios around the world. Uh, and so we've been able to, over time, go from something that's peripheral to the business and a small investment to now something that's absolutely a part of our, of our runtime. Jenny, um, that's a great story in the sense you you think about it, it's kind of you netted it out, it might be the art of the long view, right, where you had a kernel of vision, and you stayed very grounded and uh, to build up the support with the labeling, and uh, then continued on and then refined and now brought it into the operational fabric. I think that's a very important point, because uh, when you do move into the AI and data sciences field, you do need to think strategically and long term. So I'm really glad that you raised that point, Jenny. Um, Kathy, um, there's obviously many challenges. Um, you know, Ernst & Young has a very uh, progressive framework in terms of trusted AI. Um, you know, obviously, if you look at all of these little icons here, you could talk to any of them, but is there a couple that you can just dive into, Kathy, and share some stories based on what you see on an international level with your clients? Yeah, so what I would say is that as you look through, you know, the different risks and challenges of AI, um, it is going to be different on, on, on each model and uh, AI system, because it's going to change as you use different AI algorithms, have different data sets, different stakeholders being impacted, uh, different um, um, objectives. And, and I like what uh, Janie had mentioned in regards to the in, in intentionality that they had in, in, in setting the objectives. Cause I think that's really important. What I find is that a lot of the AI system failures are due to a just not enough time and really challenging their objectives that they're setting for the AI algorithm. And really thinking through the broad spectrum of scenarios of what might unintended happen. Um, and, and I know Danny had mentioned this as well in, in regards to how some of these algorithms can really optimize, um, you know, biases or, or, you know, other, other failure points. And so, you know, when we, when we talk to both companies and regulators and, and consumers, you know, privacy and security risk are definitely at the forefront of everyone's mind. Like, you know, everyone wanting to make sure that the, their personal data is, is secure, is being used in a, in a trustworthy manner and that they're not being manipulated. I, I do think that one of the rising concerns of AI is that we're all of a sudden going to have these systems that become smarter than we are and we become, you know, eventually manipulated by them. I think we're far ways from that. But there is that under, underlying, you know, weakness and, and, and insecurity that uh, we have coming to this technology. But one of the things I would say is that, um, you know, you have to come to these risks and challenges recognizing that you can't achieve perfection in each of them. There's gonna be trade-offs. Um, and what's really important is to come to the initial design table, really bringing these all to the table and really doing a real good deep dive to understand, are they applicable? If they are, how are they applicable? Um, how might they manifest? Um, you know, what can we do to you know, reduce some of the potential implications um, and, you know, in some cases it may be you accept some of them because, you know, for example, you may choose to 
uh, reduce some of the explainability of a, a particular system because it's a not required or very low risk and you'd much rather have much higher accuracy or much more deeper insights maybe using a deep neural network and so you know i think it's important to recognize that um, these aren't all equal and um, not all equal in all situations and it and what I think is um, there's been a lot of conversation about diversity at the AI design table with gender and minorities, and that's certainly important, but I think it's also important to think about diversity of thought. And, you know, do you have people at the table who think differently? The ethicists, the philosophists, the socialists, the, you know, you know, people from a risk and compliance background versus a technical background. And, you know, the more smart people you have at the table, each thinking through their own scenarios and, and perspectives, I think you'll come to a, a better application in the end. Thanks, Kathy, um, you know, for sharing the perspective on the, the data bias challenges, but also stressing uh, the diversity of perspectives, particularly through the whole uh, life cycle. Danny, um, can you pick up maybe and talk a little bit about, you know, the challenges and in investment in infrastructure on technology and machine learning operations. And obviously there's been so much change within the industry, uh, trying to really get the handle on the whole I call it inventory management of these uh, investments. So if you can pick up some of the technology lessons learned uh, and operational excellence, that would be great. Oh yeah, <clears throat> early on, uh, it was very exciting to develop new algorithms. It was even more exciting to, to you know, go and get a lot of data from around the company and build models that in, improve the business. Um, but very quickly, that sort of came back to bite us in, in, in various ways. Uh, and this includes, you know, very organized companies like Amazon, where uh, systems would probably suddenly uh, misbehave. You will realize that there's a machine learning model that it has been uh, deployed in that application. It's uh, deployed two years ago. Nobody knows anything about it. Nobody knows what data was used. Nobody even know. Uh, who, uh, who deployed the model, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we basically very quickly uh, found out that with you know, over 100 teams using machine learning, uh, that model management, uh, understanding the data behind the models was crucial. We saw the same at Microsoft when you have large organizations using machine learning, uh, the model history, the governance of data and models suddenly uh, come to the forefront. And, I think we have seen a, a, a really good push in, in this space over the last top couple of years. We've seen a number of startups that are focusing on machine learning operations. So it's basically the safe uh, building deployment uh, operation of machine learning models. It's uh, the governance of those models. Um, some of the most important things are to monitor models, how they perform over time, when they have to be rebuilt, uh, when they have to be uh, looked at, uh, when uh, there are questions around the data that uh, went into building a model, being able to go back and look at those data and, and, and see if, if, if uh, mistakes were made. Uh, so it is interesting that we sort of went from great excitement around some of the core technology, uh, the, the learning algorithms, uh, the performance of those algorithms, deploying those algorithms to really a shift now and that the main focus is actually on operating these systems that uh, understanding that they uh, should you know, keep performing and keep doing good and not, uh, not, not going bad over time. Uh, and it's it's you you if if you start you know googling a bit and looking around and 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 follow this space uh, you will see that this is basically some of the hardest activities right now is basically being better at that being better at operating these systems uh, we know they can do uh, incredible good things for the business uh, but you want them to to keep doing good and doing better over time and that basically all boils down to to proper uh, management of these systems. Yeah, for sure, Danny. And, and um, just a quick build on, on your comments. I mean, I'm starting to see at enterprise levels and especially the, the large banks, right, where they may have 
IBM infrastructure doing some modeling. Uh, they may have, um, you know, Amazon SageMaker. They may have Microsoft uh, Azure infrastructure. And so I think there's a real need architecturally, to your point, to really make some callouts on the whole data lineage and also the modeling and that inventory aspect of where the control points are. So, you know, because right now I think we've got companies at different stages of evolution and maturity. Um, and obviously, if you're in a mid market, you'll be able to probably standardize on maybe one unifying um, solution to help you advance. Um, but we see a lot of complexity in people rationalizing, um, you know, you know, I'd call it standardizing architectures. Um, and there's other views, right, in terms of centralized versus decentralized. Um, I'm going to pass it over to, um, to Zach, if you don't mind, Zach, just we'll go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, we want to bridge a little bit into the ethical concerns of AI and uh, in terms of not being aligned, there's a lot of uh, structures and regulatory frameworks that are in place and certainly whether it's whichever country you're in, you'll have some point of view. Um, but there are some gaps in the sense of semi some of the alignment uh, in clarity as we move from geo to geo to geo. So Kathy, maybe you could kick us off here in terms of uh, what you've been seeing on an international level in terms of some ethical, practical frameworks, and maybe the, the four or five constructs that might really help ground people um, on the must uh, ensure. Yeah, you know, I think we're one of the biggest alignments we're seeing right now is between um, corporate executives and regulators in thinking about how do we actually um, achieve ethical AI, um, you know, we did we did a survey last summer um, in our bridging the AI gap, and um, it was really comparing the um, the um, viewpoints of regulators and enterprise corporate executives around, you know, first of all, you know, is regulations the right way to go in regards to achieve ethical AI? And as you can imagine, regulators thought it was and that they had the capability to do it. Enterprise executives felt that no self-regulation was the better way and that regulators really didn't have the knowledge or the capabilities of regulating it anyways. Um, there was also surprisingly, you know, different um, uh, priorities that they each had um, in regards to where there needed to be more focus on, 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 uh, on, on regulation. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, be honest, a lot of corporate executives were, you know, really, challenged in thinking whether or not AI is a technology where you can really adequately regulate, you know, ethics. And I think one of the, what that brings to the fore is that, you know, ethics is not a global consensus type of, um, of uh, system. You know, each one of us have individual value systems. And, you know, some of those are shared with our communities in our countries, for example. Um, but there also can be, you know, dictated based on our own individual personalities, our experiences with our families. Some of us are religious, some of us aren't. Um, and all of those have a, a, an impact on how we would actually behave in a certain um, situation. And so, you know, there is no global ethics. And so that's the struggle with trying to come up with any kind of prescriptive mechanism uh, towards ethics. And so it does then come down to deciding with the AI systems how much of it do you design um, where there is some choice, right? Like with an autonomous vehicle, for example, is, is an easy one as to, should I, I own a Tesla, should I be able to, if I'm using autonomous system, preset some of the, um, the, um, the, the car's settings or do I have to just live with whatever Tesla chooses for me, right? And so over time, are we going to allow people to have ethical choices? as we go to use some of these AI systems or are we going to prescribe some type of global set of ethics that everyone needs to just live with? Um, but you know, it's difficult, right? Cause if you even think about stop signs, like in North America, we all stop at a stop sign. There are some regions in the world where a stop sign is basically just means I go faster so I can beat people through the, you know, like they don't mean anything. People don't react the same way to them as they might in other areas. And so, you know, I, I know I'm not, you know, giving a lot of, um, of, of solutions, but, you know, I think the solution is recognizing that um, having real dialogue with your ultimate stakeholders is really important as you go to design these systems and to have that feedback loop that Danny mentioned 
um, not just at the technical feedback loops, but the stakeholder feedback loops and, and really getting to understand how people are experiencing, um, you know, AI is going to be a more of an experiential type of technology um, experience. And so how can we capture those experiences and use that in order to, to move forward? And, and how do we recognize the stewardship that enterprises have um, to ultimate stakeholders as they're, they're using these technologies? So maybe I'll end there and see what, you know, Danny or Jeannie might have in regards to building on this question. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Danny, um, do you have a framework at Unity Technologies that's an ethical construct uh, that you have a lens to oversee all initiatives? Yes, we do. We, 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 do. we have a pop list, uh, both internal and external, uh, a set of uh, ethical uh, principles um, uh, for AI. We also have an, uh, an ethics council. And just like I have a PhD in computer science, there are people who have PhDs in ethics. It's a very, very complex topic. And what I have realized is that I'm definitely not an expert in ethics. And there are probably very few people in, in most corporations who are experts in it. Yeah. So the way I deal with it is to set up these guiding, you know, broad guiding principles and, 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 and the purpose of that is to, to drive questioning to basically get to, get to the heart of, uh, of the key challenge that tech companies, primarily tech companies face, which is uh, just because you can do it, should you really do it, yeah? And there has been a lot of that because we can do it, we'll do it, yeah? But what, what I want to emphasize with an ethical approach is to just ask lots and lots of questions, yeah? Uh, there are things that look very obvious, very, um, I would say, uh, not harmful, but when you actually start diving in and when you actually have a diverse team that sees different aspects of a problem, uh, it, it, it really makes everybody smarter and prevents some of the most, uh, I would say, blatant mistakes in, in using this technology. I can, I can provide the <clears throat> operational example of that because you know, we 75% of Wattpad's user base is outside of North America, outside of the Western lens based in North America. And <clears throat> every country has a different expectation of what um, kind of content is acceptable, what's censored, what's not. And, you know, our, if, if we're setting all of our recommendation engines and our algorithms partially run, run by AI, which allows us to operate at a much faster speed and scale than we've ever operated before, there's a very real implication of the stories that we're bringing to market. And are we doing it in a way that's, are we going to consider all of the ethical constraints of every geography that we're in? And are we pushing the content that we feel is the right content to push or the wrong content to push and how do we question things like that? And I really appreciate the construct of, it's really about questions. And so it comes back to something we talk about a lot, which is representation and diversity on your teams. There's a recent study by the AI index that shows that only 18% of authors um, at leading AI conferences are women. Um, and you know, 80% of AI professors are men. So automatically where there's a, bias in terms of the data that we're putting in. And you know, the example that I used earlier, um, we ran our quality indexer on the Gutenberg classics, right? And so dense literary fiction written by mostly white men over the ages. And our models really picked up on the stories that we got through our Wadi's Awards that were high fantasy, right? We we're like, oh, people would love this high fantasy because it ranks so well compared to the Gutenberg classics. We have a lot of people who don't care for high fantasy. They love young, fluffy romance rom-com with a lot of slang and you know, millennial language. We would have missed that completely had our own people not identified that, that gap, that if we just took what the machine gave us, we would have missed the, the mark completely on what our community actually wants to read. And so there's, that representation is, is one of the most important investments to be, that we've made. Wattpad is over 50% female that we've made to make sure that the content we're putting into the world is truly representative and diverse. Um, and, it, and I think it really, having those questions as a starting point has been very valuable for us. And I'm very curious 
to get my hands on more information on Unity's, you know, actual questions and philosophies that we can maybe get, glean from and learn from as well. Thanks, Jenny. Um, you know, one of the observations on the discussion is being patient, right? As executives, when you think about going through the life cycle, right? Spending the time on the design and allowing the dialogue to really be a deep one with many diverse perspectives, because uh, we do have this rush mentality, right? Uh, as we all know. So uh, that's, I think, a very key observation for those of you on the call is, is that the standard maybe life cycle of looking at functional requirements, software design, there's a much deeper dialogue here that needs to happen and to make sure that's part of your, you know, I'd call it your time stamping uh, in the actual project deployments. Um, Cindy, if I could just make a comment, because yeah. um, I think, you know, AI also is a very iterative technology. And so we have to appreciate that this isn't like a lot of traditional projects where you can do a lot of requirements, you know, gathering at the beginning, ask all those design questions and then just move forward. You know, you need to in every stage of the life cycle, new information becomes aware, you need to sit down again, ask more questions. And so, you know, you really do need to make sure you have that construct where you're constantly asking questions like every new iteration should be raising more questions and um and new thought processes come to the fore and so it it is just ensuring that you have that iterative model through every one of those different cycles thanks kathy that's a really good point uh, to conclude this section uh, zachary we'll go to the next section so this is just um you know a broad perspective because obviously you know you could step back and say different geos are moving at different rates um you know the us uh, has put out a very recent report in terms of perspectives on their growth versus china's growth in terms of the investments you know india as a country has really been driving a lot of leadership in these areas canada has been investing across the country in research centers so just big picture and maybe uh, danny will kick off with you in terms of just a panoramic view of some of the opportunities that you see and the goodness that ai is driving but also maybe just net out maybe some of the risks that you think the ceo ceos or c-suite must be very mindful of yeah uh, a lot of business today a lot of businesses are global and uh and it, it is getting increasingly uh, complex to deal uh, with data algorithms, with AI uh, in Europe versus the US uh, versus a number of Asian countries. Uh, let me, you know, put Russia in there as well. Um, it, uh, it, there are a lot of different regulations, a lot of different requirements. Uh, so I think that that is something companies really have to pay attention to. But I also want to flip it on its head and say, this is also some of the stuff that AI is really good at. Yeah, it's really good at, at taking a lot of diverse signals into account and come up with optimized solutions for that. So I think there's also an opportunity in uh, using uh, your AI technologies in, uh, in uh, what I would call geographically differentiated. So have the systems uh, recognize that, uh, as, as Jenny pointed out, there's, there's very different uh, interest, not, across, not only across uh, 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 different age groups, but also by geography and different cultures. So, so one of the important things about AI is that it is able to, to, to learn. There's this constant feedback loop that also basically allows you to, to utilize what's special in Europe, what's special in Russia, what's special in China, so that uh, AI actually enables you to, to deliver a much more differentiated offering than, uh, than what we have traditionally been able to do. Thanks, Danny. Um, Jenny, comments? I mean, for, for us, we do take that long-term view of the opportunities that it can bring. And we are constantly discovering ourselves what it could look like. And so, um, what, you know, one area where we are realizing we need more and more investment and where I think as we explore bigger and bigger opportunities um, in general, this will be the case is there's that first aspect where we're really focused on the algorithms and now we're really focused on the pipelines. So in other words, for us, it's, where are we going to be able to really utilize all of the, the different aspects of the models that we have? And we're starting to branch out um, 
not only the kinds of stories that were the, the kinds of uh, models that we're focused on, not just on the content, but now we're supplementing that content with user behavior data to better understand the, the, the richness that actually exists on engagement for of content itself. But we're also looking at how we can get it deeper and piped into many more aspects of our business and our product so that it's a bigger part of the user journey and the experience. And so the investments sort of grow bigger and bigger. And I think it's a Kathy's point that comes iterative, iteratively. And so the, when I think about opportunities, it may be a very different view than what you initially think, because as you learn about the outputs and the benefits, there's so much more that we start to want to invest in. And for us, that investment only grows over time. Thanks, Jenny. It reminds me of a situation where I was uh, interviewing a senior VP globally of a, of a major uh, Fortune 500 bank. And he said, you know, that last mile of, you know, we have the iterative journey, but just sustaining the feedback loops and the learnings and documenting and, uh, you know, has its own, um, own unique challenges. Um, Kathy, perspectives on any of the risks uh, that you see? I, I believe, I think you guys issued a report and uh, from a cybersecurity point of view, and AI was right up there as one of the top concerns. Well, well certainly I think that um, we're finding that, um, you know, good and bad actors are, um, are, are leveraging these technologies. Um, certainly we're seeing that, um, you know, cyber hackers, um, adversarial attacks, against um, these type of technologies are, are certainly um, keeping pace with the, um, the use of the technology and, um, and are in, in some cases even being, you know, AI is being leveraged as this robotics process automation to perpetuate some of the cyber attacks and, you know, to, uh, to make them more sophisticated. Um, and, and so, you know, I do think that we have to recognize that the opportunities and the risks are, are actually um, both accelerating at, at the same pace. And so you, you do need to continue iterating um, you, know, you know, your governance and controls and your monitoring mechanisms uh, to keep pace um, uh, with your use cases. I did want to kind of also address the opportunity side because um, I do find that as a lot of my clients, particularly those in the more traditional um, bricks and mortar type of, of industries, that they initially came to this technology through automation, like they were looking for efficiencies. Um, and, um, and really be honest, that's not the best use of, of AI. You know, I think AI is really, you know, more to, to Jeannie's earlier example as to it's best used for really coming up with out of the box ideas, ways to create new value propositions, new experiences, um, really, um, you know, hitting more of the top line, you know, revenue um, areas and not, you know, trying to reduce costs in the bottom line. And so I think organizations need to kind of start thinking about AI differently, because I do find it's, you know, just put into the toolkit of other automation type of initiatives. And I think that's really limiting then the ideas that they generate as to how they can use this technology, because, you know, it, it, it is really going to be changing the experience that you're, you're customers and your stakeholders that can have and, and, and not focusing so much on where it can just help reduce FTE, but where can it bring, you know, new insights? Where can it help to get to, you know, better and more personalized experiences? Um, and, and so that's where I think the opportunities really are going to lie. And, um, and I think too, that there is also a wide spectrum of social opportunities. Like um, there's the AI for Good conference that's just now coming into its fifth year, which is really highlighting how we can use AI to, you know, solve some of these entrenchable, you know, societal um, uh, problems like the United Nations uh, sustainability goals. And so, you know, I think it's really thinking also as to um, how we can use AI in those, those broader solutions um, for some of those global issues like climate change and, you know, um, healthcare and education to the masses. Thanks, Kathy. It's, it's really great that you're reinforcing sort of the big picture and uh, growth and enablement perspective. And, you know, we're often uh, prone to deal on the efficiency sides, but, uh, you know, some of the bigger opportunities are going to be in, like you say, in the top line revenue growth uh, areas. Uh, so we're going to move now to the open uh, questions. I'm going to turn things back to Malay. Uh, who's going to continue to guide us and I'll participate in the uh, the Q&A. So Malay, over to you. 
Thank you, uh, Cindy, and, and everyone else, the panelists, for, for a, a very insightful discussion and the viewpoints that you brought in. Uh, we have a few questions that have come in, and uh, attendees, if you have other questions, please just post them on the chat window, and I'll fire them away. Uh, starting with a question which I believe uh, would be ideal for uh, Kathy to pitch in, and of course, everyone else is welcome too. The question is, how can you integrate ethical concerns into operational practices? So, you know, I've, I've seen it done in a number of ways. Probably at the top level, we've seen a number of organizations create some ethical advisory committees, which to Danny's earlier comment are really there to ask the should we question. So if a team is concerned about whether or not they want to move forward with a project that's got some ethical considerations, they can take it to that advisory committee. I've seen also policies, you know, the principal documents that Danny mentioned, but really be honest, I think the most um, important is what, I, what I've called always these design challenge sessions, but it kind of is, is what Ginny and Danny mentioned, which is really asking questions, right? So, you know, having some, some checklists that really kind of challenge the, the, uh, the, uh, the different design teams as to really have they thought through all the different scenarios, the potential unintended consequences? Have they really challenged the objective function for the, the model and algorithm as to whether or not it's actually been designed? Do they, do they know they got the right data set? Um, do they actually have diversity of thought? Um, so to me, those design challenge sessions which can start with some prescribed checklists and questionnaires, but really does can only work if you've got the right people around the table that can ask questions outside of the um, the um, the questionnaires and and um, and and really be honest um, if you're not leaving those tables with a at least a dozen of unanswered very difficult to answer questions you've probably not done the design chest challenge uh, properly because you know these these systems should really challenge us in regards to uh, to design now I do recognize there's a full spectrum there's going to be some that are very easy to design and have very low risks and impact but you know as you move up the value um, chain of these systems I think you also move up the risk and, and impact and, and so that's where I think we need to have those kind of question sessions really be forefront in, in these uh, technologies. Thank you. Uh, Cindy, do you have any views to add there? Uh, I think the only other build I would say is I think um, the whole life cycle methodology of from design, build, run, sustain needs to have um, these design iterations in a very specified structural way as part of the project management life cycle. Um, it's very easy to go into the design dialogue the developers get really impatient. I'm sure uh, they want to start coding, you know, quickly. Um, and so it does take the project management orientation and the methodological side uh, to ensure that it's structured. Um, I think Danny could probably, um, you know, advise as well, given that he's overseeing so many data scientists and engineers and, you know, in terms of the patience to go through these cycles. Uh, I mean, you know how engineers are, Danny. Yeah. Um, so you can you can you can easily go go too fast, and I, I actually think that uh, uh, there are a couple of things that has come up to the, this morning several times. One is uh, that you need to take your data really seriously. You know, you have to really look at your data. You have to understand your data. You have to look for bias. You have to look for privacy violation, etc. That that's something that I think most engineering teams now are really on top of. They they understand that. The other thing we talked a lot about is ML ops or operations of these systems, yeah. Uh, and, and that is also being paid a lot of attention to right now. What, what I think uh, comes next that uh, is very hard for these teams to look at today is what, what I call it emergent behavior. So look in sort of the old days, a few years ago, uh, you would you would operate these systems at human speed. Yeah, there will be these requirements being made, software implemented, the software deployed, and then it will take months and months and months to get back and do anything to it in the next iteration. Yeah, uh, these AI systems have this feedback loop in there, and they improve themselves, they optimize. Yeah, and when you have two, three, four, when you have a hundred of those running across an organization, yeah, you start getting emergent behavior that is very, very hard for any single team to spot. It's only when, when you put it together and that 
all these uh, feedback loops. It's like, it's like dynamic, it's like weather systems, it's really hard to predict weather, yeah, a few days out. Well, this is what organizations are facing, yeah. And, and I think we, we keep coming back that just, uh, you know, ignoring things, not asking questions, not really paying attention is not the way to go here because you will have these systems uh, uh, interoperate in ways that were not uh, predicted. And we have, we have seen some examples of that where you get, you get sort of one part of the business amplifying, you know, certain customer behaviors and another part amplifying some other behaviors. And then when you put it together, you suddenly have some very unfortunate outcomes, yeah. So it is constantly coming back and, and try to be patient, asking these questions, not getting ahead of yourself. And just because it can be done doesn't absolutely mean it should be done yet. In the gaming world, I'm coming from the gaming world and we, you know, at Unity, we about 60% of the world's games are made on our platform. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you can do with games and they're very interactive, yeah. And uh, it's, 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 it's again, we publish these ethical principles to just make sure that game developers, they, 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 they think twice before they do stuff. I can give you examples of what can be done in games uh, uh, with like, um, you make the game slightly easier every time someone makes an in-app purchase. So every time you buy some gold nuggets in a game for real dollars, the games get slightly easier and you get much happier. Uh, that's manipulation, yeah? So we have one clause that says you have to be transparent with your user at all times. You cannot, cannot put that kind of uh, hidden behavior in there where you actually manipulate and play games with people and get them to spend more and more because they feel happier and happier. Thank you, uh, Danny, and, and thank you, Cindy and Kathy as well. The next question I think uh, would be ideal for Jenny. And the question is, uh, given the opportunities and risks, what role can managers play in navigating these with AI as a company grows? I always ask the question of our teams, what can you be the best in the world at? That's sort of how we always make uh, the bigger strategic questions and the vision. And it's not what do you want to be the best in the world at, it's, it's what can you be the best in the world at? And so how we utilize AI is in, is in response to that question. It's not that we're trying to be an AI company. It's not that we're trying to be um, something we're not, right? Or something we don't want to be. We don't want to be the world's biggest direct, you know, publishing company on that happens to be online and, and digital. Um, we can be the best at entertaining and connecting the world through stories. And now we have the scale and technology to understand stories in a way that have never been possible before. And the result of that is we can connect more people with stories that they can fall in love with um, and more entertainment with new voices that can diversify the industry. And so the, it's the guiding light of what the company is trying to do. And for us, it's bringing diverse voices to to market that have that would never ever in any other circumstance have come to light, and yet we have, you know, after um, as an example of a, a movie. Now now we're on its third sequel. Um, that it's a movie that's generated um, hundreds and millions in worldwide blockbuster revenue. Um, started as a Wattpad story, and we have shows on Hulu. We have shows on Netflix. We have shows all around the world. And so we can be the best at bringing these stories to light. We can be the best at creating a community that helps people connect on these stories. All of this work in tandem with each other. And we apply AI to help accelerate that vision. And that, that's sort of the simple premise of it. And so I, I laugh at Kathy's um, example earlier where we didn't approach it as what can we automate? We approached it as how do we become the best in the world at this? And we have a lot of data that we can utilize. Perfect, let's get on that. And now I'm at a point where I'm like, okay, how can we apply it to help us automate some things that would be a lot easier for us, right? We're going the opposite way. Um, but it really starts with what can you be the best in the world at? And we've been able to answer that question and consistently apply different technologies to help us get there. That's, that's great. Uh, and, and I did not know about the movie. That's, that's an interesting story. I must learn more Maybe about on that. Netflix now, I think you should go watch it. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, the next one, I think uh, we should start with, uh, Cindy, this would be a, a very good one for you. The question is, what is the most optimal AI organizational design for leadership? 
most optimal design for leadership? Um, well, that's a big question. Um, I think I would, first of all, uh, highlight just a very simple point. I think you need the educational foundation to have the communication dialogue. Uh, there's a lot of terms in this field, uh, unless you really level up uh, the organizational's uh, acumen on uh, context, uh, it's very difficult to uh, translate, uh, I would say, because there is different language. And we've certainly seen uh, CIOs not having the skills um, in this area. Uh, and obviously, we're seeing, you know, bringing data scientists in uh, as equal officers often. Uh, so I think that educational foundation is key. The second, I would say, is the organizational design and really thinking that through very, very deeply. Um, and I think also I'd be remiss if I didn't comment on the duty of care at the board of directors. I think that in order to secure the investments and the size of the investments to do this well, uh, you definitely need engagement with the board. Uh, I believe, Danny, you're pretty active communicating what you do at the board of directors. And uh, I think that makes a huge difference, right? Because uh, you got to bring everybody along in the journey. I do think that... Um, you know, HR organizations, as they look at their learning and development pathways, they have to find the continuity um, for ensuring that um, AI is understood. Um, I think there's a lot of gaps in Malay in, uh, we see this all the time in our client work, right? Where it's uh, marginalized in the language, where it's in small teams, um, but it's not necessarily broadly um, enabled. And so you run into change management issues and, and complexities. Uh, it's become as fundamental, I would say, as we all, for those of us of business backgrounds, myself included, you know, we had to learn uh, the importance of a balance sheet and an income statement and the importance of a PL and the drivers of growth or, um, or transgression. We do need to level up the language uh, of leadership and AI. And I've been writing a lot of uh, blogs in the Forbes channel about the language. So I think uh, that could be a helpful uh, source for people. Okay. Um, Kathy or Danny or Jenny, any uh, builds on that? Maybe a quick build. You know, I think what does also matter is how you were going to adopt AI. So a lot of the early entrants, um, you know, hired in data scientists and they, they, they built it in house, but we're moving to a model now where I think many organizations are going to license or, um, you know, leverage pre-existing um, algorithms through open source or, or other technology companies. So, you know, I think it's going to be a hybrid where they're probably going to, um, you know, license it or, or, or adopt it from third parties and maybe do some customizations. And so I, I think those two different models require a, a very different kind of enterprise model to, to govern and, and, and manage them. And it's gonna be much more of relying on you know, due diligence of, of third parties and procurement and um, then, then, you know, like, um, you know, traditional oversight over data scientists directly developing the models. And so, you know, I do think that needs to be taken into consideration is really thinking about what actually capabilities do you have as an organization? How might you then, you know, leverage um, AI? And, and, you know, to be honest, there's just not enough data scientists in the world for every organization to build their own shop. So by necessity, I think we're gonna have to have those kind of models. So just wanted to kind of add that to the conversation. Thank you. Uh, yes. I, I, I would I would emphasize that <clears throat> AI is one of these rare technologies that it's very disruptive. It is changing the game. They they these technologies they don't come that often. You know, it's every five ten years, and and I think uh, the most important advice I can give is to think strategically about it. Don't let it happen randomly, decentralized. Uh, I hear a lot of people saying I can't hire AI people. Yeah, but that's because you try to hire AI people into, and I'm going to exaggerate, into an accounting team. You're trying to hire them into to teams that they have no interest in joining. Yeah, uh, You need to look at data science and AI uh, and data as strategic uh, to the company. You have to centralize, but it doesn't mean that it's centralized in, in an old fashioned way. It means that there is a discipline for data science. There's a discipline for AI. Uh, yes, 
uh, the data scientists can be embedded within teams, yeah, but they do have a career path, they do have a community. And I, I, I think that the word here is strategic, you have to think about this as strategic, not, not as a random operational thing, now we're going to throw AI in, you know, at different places in the company randomly and on their own, you know, on each team's uh, initiative. So we really look at it as like, this is going to change the company and we want to be on top of it. All right, uh, Danny, thank you for that, Bill, and Kathy, to you as well. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, this would be the last question uh, that I'll present to the panel. And uh, I hope I read this correctly. Um, please uh, advise me if I don't. Uh, but the question relates to companies from LATAM countries in particular. Uh, we can consider it in a more generic way. The question is, how can companies help in, in these practices in terms of spreading the word and sharing information and cases literature to create big platforms that would help increase the best use of AI to beat all these challenges. Essentially, if I, if I can summarize this, the, the question is how can all these thoughts and good ideas be, be spread over to, to create big platforms that will help other companies follow suite and, and adopt the best practices uh, in using AI? So maybe I can give a quick example from financial services. Um, so I, I know that there are, like for example, you know, requirements for banks to to do, you know, anti money laundering activities. Um, they are not competitive it, it, with each other in regards to performing that function, but they're regulated too, right? And so there's, the, you know, they're currently working together to try and, from a consortium perspective, think about how can we together actually work to um, to combat anti-money laundering. And be honest, right now, it's the regulators right now that are holding them back because they regulate that they can't share information with each other. So they're like, you know, all I can do is make decisions based on my own transactional activity. But if I could compare that with the transactional activity of my next five peers, just imagine the information we would have to be able to find pa better patterns of anti-money laundering. And so um, so I think that, um, you know, that's where you can work to kind of think about, you know, there's going to be certain areas in your enterprise where it is competitive, where you do want to think about having that type of, you know, competitive relationship, but there's a lot of functions you do where you can have more of a consortium or an ecosystem view and, and really thinking about how to, to assist each other um, in those areas. Okay. Uh, Jenny, any builds from your side? I mean, it it's hard without the context of um, where the question is coming from in terms of org size or industry. But my only quick suggestion here is uh, whenever we've had a gap in um, the ecosystem where WAPAD is based in Toronto and Canada, um, we sort of are not shy about filling that gap. So reaching out to folks who are doing something similar at a much bigger scale, um, reaching out to folks who are doing it at a scale and learning. Um, just learning at this point. And then over time, to Kathy's point, it could evolve into something much bigger and better. All right. And uh, any final comments uh, from uh, Danny and Cindy as well? No, I, I don't have a, have a build, Malay. I'm, I'm, uh, I know that uh, there's a few uh, wrap up comments. Uh, all good here. Thank you. Danny? I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Panel, all right. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so can we move to the next slide? Thank you, uh, Zachary. So with that, we come to the conclusion of the session today, and I invite everyone listening in to visit the AI Knowledge Center over at Sales Choice on our website under the resources section. You can find it at saleschoice.com slash resources. And it's a great repository of excellent thought leadership material, guidance, and a lot of knowledge coming in straight from industry experts across multiple industries and geographies. It's uh, really a rich uh, uh, a piece to get hold of. And you can easily access that as well as follow Dr. Cindy Gordon and her articles on Forbes at forbes.com slash sites slash Cindy Gordon, where she on a weekly basis posts in new material and thoughts that are worth having discussions around when it comes to AI and its uh, adoption in a successful and responsible way. If we move to the next slide, 
The big news, of course, uh, coming from uh, the house here is the launch of our new book, The AI Dilemma, uh, where Cindy and I have worked in or put in three years of research rigorously bringing in a lot of depth on whether AI will create a perfect world or a perfect storm across multiple industries as well as governments and what they're doing and their policies. We also have a framework to assess organizational AI maturity, which can be a great way to kickstart your AI journey in within the organization and understand where the gaps are. You can find the books, of course, on Amazon as well as other leading stores around the globe. But if you prefer ebooks in particular, you can get it at 20% off until I believe the 20th of this month. Uh, the link is given there, but uh, it will be easier for you to just uh, send a note uh, to either Cindy or myself, and we'll be happy to provide you with a, with a coupon, with a code to avail that discount. And it should be a fascinating read, uh, so go ahead. Uh, next slide, please, Zachary. A quick parting word also for the Bedford group. They have supported us in putting this together and we can't thank them enough. Howard and Stephen Pedzim, uh, their email addresses are on your screen. If you wish to contact them, their LinkedIn information is there as well. Um, and uh, Zachary Wan, of course, who has been supporting us uh, and the logistics on the back end. Thank you so much. We are truly appreciative of, of uh, your time. And uh, so moving to the final slide, this is where I shall bid adieu and uh, thank all my panelists and uh, Cindy for co-hosting this. Uh, the contact details are on your screen. Take a screenshot or just note it down and uh, feel free to reach out to any of us at any time. We are happy to answer questions. Um, Jenny, Danny, Kathy, Thank you so much for sharing your valuable time. We know you're running busy, but I'm sure all of us have gained tremendously from all your insights and we hope to continue to do so. Uh, Cindy, uh, thank you so much for of course hosting this and facilitating the session. I wish everyone a wonderful, wonderful rest of the week and month and stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>